mentality is what is working on his farming operation and what he sees working on farming operations around Kentucky. So, Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me um, at this conference. And, and you all know you've got two incredible presenters here that, that normally wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to get together like this, Ray Archuleta and Jim Garrish. So you've already seen one. You'll see the other this afternoon. I consider that an honor to be on the program with the two of them. Uh, they're two of the best at what they do in ter terms of soil health and, and kind of rotational extended season grazing. So we're all lucky here today. What I'm going to focus on here is, is basically something I usually um, go over at our grazing school. So the previous version is really geared towards kind of in the beginning stages of rotational grazing. So what I've done here today is kind of modify that. I, I assumed we'd have a lot more advanced type grazers here. So I've tried to modify more towards that audience. So that said, hopefully this works out. Sure. Is this good? All right. All right, so we're going to have four myths that we're going to look at. The first three, think of the first three as, as typical mistakes that beginners would make from the, just from the standpoint of trying to do something too well, if that makes sense. So sometimes we want to do things too much to the T, too well. And those first three myths are, are kind of like that. The fourth is, is a little different. So myth number one, try to look at the picture and, and see if this makes sense to you, that you have to move your cattle every day. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't move your cattle every day. A lot of farms, that, that makes a lot of sense. What I'm going to basically try to show you is that for a lot of farms, particularly smaller ones, uh, you don't really have to do that. And, and from a strict, um, <clears throat> from your labor perspective, it, it probably doesn't make sense. So we'll look at that in table format. You can kind of pick what, given your farm size, what may make sense. So one thing I, I like to start off with this is, is that as a basis of why you maybe don't have to move your cattle every day is, is research that was done in the 1950s and 60s at Virginia Tech by Roy Blazer and, and some of his colleagues. Uh, what they did is they did a lot of foundational rotational grazing work. Uh, this is just one of the many things that they did, but, but this was very simple. They just looked at continuous grazing um, in, in the Virginia area, and they looked at various intensities of rotational grazing. And what they found is the very ba the, the first breakup that they made going from continuous to rotational, which they called the Middleburg Three. In other words, they just had a simple three paddock system that they rotated the cattle through. So probably a week and a half to two week rotations. Again, not saying that's what we, we all want to do, but just the point I'm trying to make is they found that the, the bulk of the increase in, in benefits from rotational grazing from the grass growth standpoint, maybe not, and that's what they focused on, on, on the, the grass growth standpoint. The biggest benefits went simply from going from continuous to breaking into three paddocks. Now they continue to get additional benefits by going in smaller and smaller increments, but, but as, as they went in terms of grazing efficiency or grazing intensity, those benefits kept getting smaller and smaller. So keep that in mind. Um, so I, I want, you, want us to think about costs that are associated with this. So if we're going from whether it's that three paddock system or maybe once a week moving system, as we increase in intensity, what additional costs are you going to have to do that? So to me, there, there are, are two main costs. One would be actual infrastructure costs. The other would be labor costs. We're going to focus on labor costs, but keep in mind that infrastructure costs would be in addition to that. So in this case, uh, you know, I've, I'm trying to do things a little more intense here. This is on uh, lease ground. So I've got a portable energizer. I've, I've got additional portable fencing. Not very expensive, but you can see more labor intensive, right? So keep that in mind. Either have more labor going into this, or you're going to have additional infrastructure to make that work. So we're going to start with a 30 cow herd. We're going to change that. We're, just, we're starting with 30. Then we're going to go up all the way up to 200 cows. But let's start with a 30 cow herd. You're going to see the same general table twice. I'll go over it once here. Uh, so you're going to have, a, in the end, you're going to see a, a dollar per cow per day figure down there. I'll put that in context in a minute, so don't worry about that yet. Um, on the upper side, we're going to see days between paddock moves. So we're going to start with once a week, every seven days. We're going to look at every three and a half days, so twice a week, every two days, every one day. On the left-hand side, this, think of this as, as the average amount of time that it takes you to move the cattle. Now think of this, don't think of this in terms of when you put that first temporary post in the ground. Think about when you, when you start putting on your boots at the house, 
and when you take them off when you're done. Does that make sense? Because those are two very different things, and I see people laughing, right? So think about that. Also think about not the perfect time when everything goes right. Think average in all the times where it took you two or three hours where something went wrong, right? Something happened in the water. Average all those in. Now I'm going to give you a range here, and there's some people that probably can do it consistently in 15 minutes, but probably not very many, and if they do, they probably have a lot of permanent inf infrastructure to make that happen. I'm going to say, in my experience, on average, with me, it's probably 45 minutes. So I'm going to use that as an example. Um, and then, yeah, so let's just look at the numbers. So we're going to use 45 minutes average. We're going to start with one, once a week moves. So in other words, if I'm moving my, my cow herd once a week, and I've got a 30 cow herd, uh, and it takes me roughly 45 minutes per move to do that, it's costing me 13 cents per cow per day. Now, to give you context, and it's been a few years since I've done this, but back in New York, when, when I used to, I didn't personally, but my partner custom grazed up there on, when we were developing that farm. We did some custom grazing work for other farmers in the area. The going rate to custom graze an was about a dollar per day, if that makes sense. In other words, we were getting a dollar per day. If it's only costing me 13 cents in labor, that probably is a reasonable number. Is that, does that, would you all agree? We still have other costs, but it's probably reasonable. So if we went from, with a 30 cow herd, from once a week to, every, to twice a week, it's going to go up to 18 cents per cow per day. Every two days, 26 cents. And every day, if we're doing that, it's 45 cents. So, so if we're getting a dollar a day, and we have already got 45 cents in labor, not including anything else, infrastructure, uh, pasture costs, I can t without going into detail, that's too high a number for that amount of money that we're getting with 30 cows. It's going to change if we have bigger herds. Um, so what would I, what is my, and, and I'm summarizing here, um, I typically would go into a little more detail, but just to summarize, for a 30 cow herd during the grazing season, so, so let's say from April to uh, September, something like that, probably a reasonable amount of, of moves on, a, on that size farm would be twice a week. And if, if you go beyond that, it, at least if it's taking 45 minutes, you probably got more labor into that than you want. Now, if you can consistently move the cattle in 30 minutes or 15 minutes, you can probably go every two days. That would make sense. Now, once we get beyond, say, September into fall and winter, an additional grazing day that you get is going to be worth more. Would you all agree? Because that's saving me a day from feeding hay. So, in, in other words, the value that I'm getting goes from maybe a dollar a day to two dollars a day. So, in other words, I can afford to be more, to have more labor into that. So we can we can we can afford to move more often. Probably every once every two days, if it's taking me 45 minutes. Again, if I can do it in 30 minutes, maybe every day in that situation. Does that any questions real quickly? Does that make sense what we're doing here? All right. So this is where it becomes very interesting when we change the herd size. So again, that was for a 30 cow herd, which is pretty typical in Kentucky, right? But now this is what I want you to see, and this is the main point I'm trying to get to, is that it will change radically by how many cows you have in that herd or how many stock or cattle you're grazing, whatever. And so we're going to look at not just 30, we're going to look all the way up to 200 cows. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix um, the amount of time per move that it takes you at 45 minutes for each scenario, and we're going to look at the same number of days. So I'm going to put everything in there. Now, you already saw this, right? We already looked at the 30 cow herd, started at 13 cents, went to 18, all the way up to 45, right? What we're going to do now is look at it, that same type of system with 200 cow, with a herd of 200 cows. Starts at 2 cents per cow per day, goes to 3, 4, and 7. Do you all see something very different there? Which one of those farms can afford to move their cattle every day? That one, right? In fact, it's, we can move a, a herd of 200 cattle once a day cheaper than the herd side, the farm of 30 cows can move it once a week. And the point I'm trying to get to is if you see a farm advocating we need to move once a, a day or twice or three times a day. So uh, Ray Archuleta talked about the farm in, in Mexico, right? 500 cattle, is that what you told me? So he has a herd of 500 cows. Uh, that would be way down here, right? Can that, and they're moving twice a day, right? 
can that farm afford to move, can they move those cattle twice a day? Yes, their cost per cow per day is a lot lower even twice a day than that, that 30 cow herd is moving once a week. And that's my, my only point. We don't all have to move every day. I'm not saying you shouldn't. Uh, there are certain situations, even with a smaller herd, that you could, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. So that gives us to the caveats. So the first one, if your other next best alternative instead of moving the cattle is, say, sitting on the couch, watching TV, eating potato chips, and drinking soda pop, by all means, go move those cattle. Because <laughs> that will improve your, your mental and physical health. And I'm serious on that. You know, there's some things I do in my farming operation that may not make sense from a financial standpoint, but I do it because what? Because of those two. I can easily afford a, a, a three-point seater for the back of my tractor. I do it by hand. Guess why? Because I'm in terrible shape come late March. And, and Jeff knows I want to be in good shape during turkey season, right? Because the gorge has some pretty, pretty tough hills. So I, get, I count that as exercise, right? I don't count that as, as labor, because it really is. It's, it's, it's my exercise in March. Here's another one. This is particularly true for beginners. So if you're out there more often with a caveat that you're actually trying to observe what's going on, you will learn much quicker by being out there every day or every, every second day in that situation. So particularly when you're in the beginning stages, you may want to move cattle more often just for that benefit. And then I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of other unique situations that I'm not going to think about uh, that would kind of fall in that same category. So here's one of them. I'm sure there's lots of them. But one potential um, caveat would be if you have something to improve or reduce your labor. Bat latch is, is one of those methods. So what the bat latch is, and that's this device right here, it is a solar-powered electronic timer with a cam on the end of it that you could program anywhere from an hour from now to, to two weeks from now. When that timer goes off, well, let's look at everything. You've got a handle here. You've got either a, a coil or a bungee cord, which is what usually what I use now. Uh, you've even got a bell. That's more for the humans and the cattle. Um, but when that timer goes off, that the cam revolves 180 degrees, and guess what it releases? That handle, right? If we look at it from a distance, this is what we just looked at. There's the bat latch. Here's the next post. That pulls itself over, right, when that goes off. And guess what Guess what you just did? I could have been back in upstate New York where I'm from, and that just opened itself up, right, and the cattle moved. Now, it is $400, or it was $400 pre-COVID. I'm sure it's $450 or, or $75. But I can tell you without a doubt, that is, I've got a, a higher return on that piece of equipment than anything else on the farm, for sure. All right, myth number two. And some of these hopefully are exaggerations, uh, but obviously it's real, real life. Didn't occur in, in Kentucky, this is in Virginia. Um, but myth number two, cattle need to clean up the pasture before we move them. Has anyone heard that before or, or thought that before? Come on, let's all raise our hands because most of us probably, maybe not, maybe that's exaggeration, hopefully it is, but probably most of us have, have thought to some degree that we can't leave a lot of grass there right before we move them. This is probably the most common mistake I see being made and is by far, in my opinion, the most costly. So if we get to this point, or even if we get to half this point, what is the, probably the biggest cost that we're going to have by doing that? Would you all agree that the performance on these cattle is probably going to go down considerably? So what are those decreases in performance? So the first one, probably the most obvious, would be lower weaning weights on the calves. We can see that moderately quick, like within six months or so. This next one probably is really hard to see. Is, is Les still here? <laughs> he didn't see this, so I'll, I will paraphrase what I think Les would say. If, if, I, if, if we have a herd that we're pushing that hard, my guess, my guess is we went from, and we're doing everything else right, and he was hoping to get 95% breeding rate, we probably just went from 95 to 75. Is that, Jeff, would that be maybe accurate? So in other words, but that's hard. Would you all agree to say it's hard to know that, right? Was it because of our grazing management? Was it, was it because of the bull? What was it because? Was it because less messed up when he came and visited the farm? And who knows, right? <laughs> and then I would I would argue there's all sorts of health problems that we may have in the cattle that we have no idea what pink eye, right? 
all of us wonder what, you know, why are we getting pink eye? Could it be because we're pushing the cattle too much? Possibly. Um, so that's on the performance side. So here's another picture. This is in South Central Kentucky. I'm going to argue this is, this is a worse situation than what we saw in that first picture. Because that first picture was in late fall, right? So at least by getting extra grazing day, I, I saved a day of feeding hay, right? Now, I'm not saying you want to do it, but that, we saved something, right? This is late April. What am I saving by pushing the cattle this time? Now, Les was back, I think it was Les. Yeah, Les said that when we go into breeding season, we want a body condition five or six, right? Now, I can assure you on this farm, and, I, and I'm pretty sure the, this farm is, there, no one from this farm is here right now, so I, I can talk candidly here. Let's just say they, they, don't have the be, they don't have the best quality hay in the world feeding over the winter time. Not terrible, but not the best quality, and they probably make them clean up a little bit too much. So those cattle come out of winter in a, I'm not going to say rough situation, but, but not, not anything close to five or six. And so if they come out of winter at maybe a, a body condition three score, and we're pushing them this hard in, in late April when they should be gaining, right, are they going to get to five or six less? They are. No, they're a spring cabin. So the point is, we're hurting performance at the time of year that what? We need to be putting on body condition here. All right, so unfortunately, it's not just the reduced animal, animal performance. What else is going to suffer by, by making the cattle clean up the pastures like that? What's the other side of the coin? How about pasture growth? Is that going to negatively impact pasture growth? And we have the perfect person here to, to talk about this in more detail later on, Jim Garish, because what I'm going to show you next, Jim Garish did the research on. So this was done at the Missouri Forage Research Systems Research Center. Jim was part of the, the group that did this, this research. And, and what they looked at is exactly what we're talking about. Well, so basically, they over and, and we talked about yesterday, this is four years of data, right? Four years, five years of complete data over the entire grazing season. What they did is they looked at how does the residual height after we take the cattle off, how does that impact subsequent pasture growth? And so what they did is they looked at everything from like two inches, so, so about what we saw in those pictures, right, to about six inches or to eight inches. And then on the left-hand side, that's the actual pasture growth in pounds per day on average. Don't worry about the exact numbers. We'll just look at the differences for context. So let's look at it if we're pushing the cattle too hard. It, so in other words, we're taking down to two inches, and we draw this line back over. It looks like the average growth rate is about 33, 34 pounds per day. Does that look about right? What if instead we went to six inches? We drew that line back over. It's about 55, right? Or if we use this as, as the base, the other way of looking at this is we've reduced our overall pasture growth by 40%. Is that a pretty big cost? Just because we were what? We wanted to clean up that pasture. So why is this so common? Why do we see that way more often than we want to admit, even on our own farms? And, and Jim actually had a good reason for this yesterday. He has a, a support group, right, Jim? What's your support group called? <laughs> and what, what is the, the, the opening mantra that you make them say? The third one. Amen. All right, this is going to set us up for the third myth. Has anyone heard of Andre Voisin? Has anyone r r read his book, Grass Productivity? Two, two, three, excellent. I consider it one of the foundational books on ro rotational grazing. I would highly recommend it to anyone in this room. Uh, Andre Voisin has a, a number of grazing myths. I'm going to focus on the sec his second law of rotational grazing. I'll just, I don't typically like reading things verbatim, but period of occupation for paddocks should not allow grass to be sheared more than once. Uh, another way of, of paraphrasing this is, is don't let the cattle back graze. Is that more common terminology? In other words, once you graze that down, you don't want the grass to grow up enough where what? The cattle can go back and wrap their tongue around it, right? That's what, what he's saying. Don't let that occur. Um, and I agree with that 95% of the time, but that gets us to myth number three. 
And that's never allow cattle to back graze. Now, I want to make sure you don't misquote me on this. I don't mean I want you to back, let the cattle back graze, but I want to focus on one word here, and that's never. Once we go from generally I don't want you to back graze to never let the cattle, or never allow the cattle to back graze, that's going to be very costly to do. By the way, does it look like this farm back grazes? A little bit. So that's the extreme, right? So I'm not saying go to that level. I'm just saying once we go to never, that's going to be very costly. So first of all, what is, what is the cost when we do let cattle back graze? We're looking at it, right? You're going to have golf course type pastures, right? So we don't, want to, we don't want to let the cattle back graze in general, but I also now want you to think about what are the costs to get there. If we're never going to let the cattle back graze, what are the costs going to be to get us there? So one would be, same picture, additional infrastructure, right? Either permanent, which is going to be very costly installed, or temporary in terms of our labor. Would you all agree? Now, this is something probably many of us haven't thought about. What is the cost if you don't allocate enough pasture? So in other words, if we're going to never let our cattle back graze, that means we're going to have them in fairly tight pastures, right? Are you always able to, to predict exactly how much pasture you should give that your herd for one or two days? No. And so if you underpredict what happens during that, that rotation, performance goes down, right? So there's a cost, because we're never going to be perfect, right? Half the time we're going to be under versus over. So there's a cost to, just to the animal performance to, to try to get to that perfection. I'm going to show you just a practical example. Uh, let's see here. So this is the second farm um, that I have in Woodford County. It's still in development in terms of infrastructure. So I've, I've had some what I call semi-permanent um, one watt or one yeah, one wire electric up, which you're seeing here with a dotted line. And I've got, got two water points, just you know, temporary water tanks that, that, that are set there semi-permanently. So what I want to show you is, is this is not perfection. It's just getting good enough is, is what I want to say. And this will probably change long term, but, but for the last couple of years, this is what I've been doing. Um, so here's the water point that's going to be used for what I'm going to show you here. So the cattle start here. They have access to this area. And then I just gradually move them across that both directions. Now that whole time will take anywhere from 10 to 14 days because it's about, it's almost not quite half the farm, but a third of the farm or so. So at that point, if I'm not careful, I promise you I can have cattle that are going to want to back graze in that area that they started with. Would you all agree? But they're only going to do that in what situation? if they're not happy, which means if they're hungry, right? So in other words, if I do my job and I allocate enough pasture back here and don't push them too hard, I'm not going to say there will be no back grazing here, but there's going to be very little going on. So if I do see cattle back grazing here, if I come out from the house, walk up on the hill and see cattle back grazing, that just told me what? That I screwed up, right? And then I shut that off and they're done. So again, when they're in those back portions, yeah, I can have back grazing occurring in that area, but if I do my job right, it will be very little. So it's not a perfect system, but I would contend I get at least 90% of the benefits of the, of the most elaborate infrastructure system you could put in there at a fraction of the cost. And my point is you don't have to be perfect. You can be good enough. Um, by the way, there's one area that, that essentially is a rotational graze in this pasture, and that's the area right here around the water tank that they have access to, which I pointed out yesterday is, is kind of a benefit because when I take people to, to look at the farm, I can show them what? This is continuous grazing versus the rotational. And it's really shown up this last year with the drought. Um, so again, look at this farm. We don't want that much back grazing that that occurs, but we also what? Don't want perfection to be the enemy of the good. And that's my only point. Uh, how am I doing on time, Ray? Oh, we got plenty of time. So, so let me just stop real quickly. Any questions at this point? And we'll hit the last myth, which I think is the most important one. No questions? Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, so let's, yes, I could put portable water sources out here for sure. Is there a cost in doing that? Yes. Oh, yeah. If I had a water source in each one of these and, and then shut the back fence off, I'd have zero back grazing. Absolutely. But my point is what? There's a big cost to doing that. And I think I'm getting at least 90% of the benefits. If I do my job right, is that, that $100,000 infrastructure system. And I will improve on this, and I'm going to the next couple of years, but not, it's going to be a slight improvement. I would rather have be more management intensive than, than infrastructure intensive. All right, so the last myth, and this will set us up for this. And by the way, I think right now this is, and you'll see what, I, what I'm getting at here in a second, but this by far is, is probably the biggest myth in, in terms of that can save you money and improve your profitability in the next few years. And, and maybe indefinitely, we, we just don't know where fertilizer prices are going. So what I'm going to show you is where fertilizer prices were in, in 2021 and then where they were this last spring. Um, and, and those of you that use a lot of commercial fertilizer, just as a warning, you may want to leave right now. All right, so here's where we were. And I've got it on a per ton and per unit basis conversion, whichever one you want to look at. And I'm going to do the same for spring of, of 2021 um, and let you compare the two. Does that look good? So let me just say this. These prices look cheap right now. But let me say, in, in a commercial cow-calf operation, you know, unless you're doing something like you're getting a, a huge bonus for breeding stock or something like that, or less is going to buy your, you know, your special bulls for twice the going rate, um, you're probably, if, if you're relying heavily on commercial fertilizer on a cattle farm, on a conventional cow-calf operation, even with these prices, you essentially, in the last four or five years, were trading away pretty much all your potential profit for that use of commercial fertilizer for your addiction, of, as Ray would call it. Maybe I shouldn't put words in his mouth. I think that's what he said. Um, and that was at those prices. What about 2021 prices? You're going to be trading with a lot more than that, right? Maybe you're longer in solvency unless you're heavily subsidizing that operation. And that brings us to myth number four that commercial fertilizer is needed on, on cattle farms. Now, one quick caveat before I extend this. So if you are making a lot of hay that, that either you're selling or say this is on rented ground and you're exporting to a different farm, in that situation, yeah, you're probably in the short run going to need at least potash uh, in that situation. But if you're using most of that hay on your own farm uh, or if you're buying your hay, you have no need for commercial fertilizer on a cattle farm. And we'll talk about that here. So, by the way, this is a 10 or 15 minute summary of a 45 minute presentation. Will we we did this presentation at, at your at, in Clay County, right? And what I was surprised by how how long did it take us after the presentation to get out of there? We were there for like 45 minutes because we had just a barrage of questions. Not the whole group, but about six or eight individual uh, farmers. Afterwards, people were interested in this, right? So you're getting a, a 10, 15 minute summary of a 45 minute presentation, keep that in mind. Uh, so I'm not gonna cover everything, but hopefully the first idea, first way we can reduce dependency should be obvious using legumes for our nitrogen, right? Now I'm not gonna talk about clover, which is our long term, which most of us wanna get to. What I'm gonna talk about is one legume that, that I think is highly underutilized in Kentucky, Missouri, the entire fescue belt, and that's annual lesbadiza. Um, now, this is the typical situation where you would use annual lesbadiza. This is on permanent pasture. This is on rental ground uh, that was in lo lower infertility. And so if you're going to do this on permanent pasture, you want it, or on hay ground, you want it in a situation where the fertility is only fair. In other words, if you get really vigorous growth without commercial fertilizer in late May and June, annual lesbadiza is not going to work that well because it would be out-competed out by the grasses and, and clover if you have it there. But if you don't put nitrogen down in the spring and you only get fair growth, annual lesbadiza will work great in that situation. And so this is what you're looking at. This is mid-July. And if we look at close in on that sward that we just looked at, that's what we, that's 12 inches right there in mid-July. Does that look like a good forage to have when we start going into the heat of the summer? And it's a warm season legume, so it's producing almost all of its forage in late June, July, and August when we need it the most. 
Now that's what we typically think of, of annual Espadiza. One thing I've done, I've worked with a few farms that have, that have done the next um, use of annual Espadiza, and I think it's even a bigger tool than on permanent pastures, what you're going to see next. So this is almost a pure stand. It was ground, it was marginal row crop ground um, about six, seven years ago that they took out of production, integrated crop um, livestock operation. They wanted to convert it to permanent pasture. I was working with them on bale grazing and, and I convinced them, let's just try putting in an annual Espadiza for one year to see what it does. I didn't know for sure, but I'd read that they, they used to do this in Kentucky. We used to have millions of acres of permanent Espadiza pasture. They, they would double crop with small grains. Does it look like they got a pretty good stand? There's a few weeds in there, right? But I can assure you, if, if you randomly put a, a grazing stick anywhere in that field, that's what it looked like. Zero fertilizer. It produces its own nitrogen, does, needs very little phosphorus or potassium. It's kind of it's like buckwheat. It scavenges it and, and converts what's not plant available to available. This is about 10 days later. There's 20 inches on the grazing stick. First of all, Annual Espadiza is, is oftentimes has a bad reputation as a low yielding plant. Does that look lo like it's low yielding? Uh, so is it a low productivity legume? I, I've not seen any research in the last 20 years on it. Actually, the, I have. The only one I've seen is a county agent in Virginia, Matt Boer, uh, did a, a little bit of research on it. Um, here, the, most of what I found is in the 30s, 40s. So here, here's a publication from the 1930s. It's, it's from the University of Missouri. Uh, again, I'll just read very quickly. Care and capacity over the period of late June to early October is not equaled by any other pasture plant that we know of. Seems like a pretty strong statement to me. Someone that actually did research on it is saying otherwise. Here's another one. It was from the 1930s. It was by the USDA, but they're actually, in this paragraph, they're talking about Kentucky. The Kentucky Station, my guess is we wouldn't be able to figure out was it Princeton or, or, or was it Lexington, but somewhere here in Kentucky we did research in the 1930s and what they say? They're at, they estimated that we can have at least 1,000 pounds of live weight continually on that pasture from late June to early October. Now, I personally would not do that because after beginning of September or late August, the quality goes down a lot, so I want to stock heavier in July and August, essentially remove it all by end of August, leave enough so that it can reseed, which it will do very nicely if you take the cattle off at that time, but stock twice that heavy. Does that look like a low productivity legume? This would be on a permanent pad, or this would be in a pure stand, by the way, not, not mixed in with a pasture, but a permanent stand, or a, a pure stand like we saw. So it's not gonna, and by the way, I consider annual lesbides in pasture as a bridge legume. In other words, it will, it's probably your only legume that's going to work real well with low fertility. Once you build that fertility up, the clovers will start filling in, and you don't need it anymore. In long run, and we'll talk about this at the very end, you don't even need the clover there long run. Because once you build up the organic matter, guess what's going to happen? It's going to release enough nitrogen without any legume in there. Not We still want to get the legume in there, but it's not even necessary in terms of pasture growth. Um, and again, the best benefit is you need no, absolutely no fertilizer with that legume. No nitrogen, no phosphorus, no potassium. You don't even need lime. It will do well with a pH of 5, 5, 5, 6. Won't do as good as if you increase a little bit, but it will do good in a low fertility situation. All right, uh, myth number three, two. Or, I'm sorry, last myth, but, but the second part of, of that myth. Bale grazing. So how else can we reduce our dependency on commercial fertilizer? Bale grazing. Now, this is completely serendipitous, but we have two of the best bale grazers in the state. They're sitting side by side, and they did not even know each other until this morning. So Melissa Ballard, raise your hand. So she's in Shelby County. Her and her husband have been bale grazing for what, eight years now? About eight years. And then Megan McCown, who's our new county agent in Henry County, she's been bale grazing for three, four years. Two of the best bale grazers in the state sitting side by side, completely serendipitous. Uh, so if you're in that area, either one of those ladies can help you out. It, I, I'm glad I'm kind of like less. I don't make that many farm visits, less you got me beat by quite a few, but I'm gaining on you. Uh, and my favorite farm visit to do is, is with bale grazing. So if you're interested, give me a call, give your county agent a call. Um, I'd like to come out there. Um, Lindsay, I'm trying to remember the last name of the county agent, Bourbon County. Is she here today? Are you going to bale graze this winter? 
Okay, so we talked earlier, three or four months ago. So you are going to bail graze, and is it Nicholas County that the farm's in? Say it again. Okay, Harrison County. So we'll have another data point here in a couple years to see how they're doing. Ten minutes, we're doing good. All right, so I'm not going to spend much time on bail grazing. This is a two-slide version of, of a 45-minute presentation. Uh, but this is what it looks like before. And if you do your job right, this is what it will look like after. And, and look at the, um, the lighting on this isn't quite as good. Look on, I can't see where, the, there's two other projectors. You can see better that the manure distribution on those. Does it look like that might be a, a fair amount of fertilizer value? Now, five years ago, I would have stopped right there. To me, that, that's what I'm getting is fertilizer value. But probably for the last five years in very slow increments, even before I knew Ray Archuleta's name, I started hearing about this biology, the soil biology, and, and how it had a huge, or it can potentially have a huge impact on fertility. And initially, if I saw Ray five years ago, I would have, I would have said, this guy is a sheep and a sheep and wolves, or a wolf in, in sheep's clothing here. And I would say, you know, this guy, he doesn't go home to Missouri. He goes back, he goes home to San Francisco, puts on his Birkenstocks, and probably sipping on lattes at, at some cafe. Um, but I can tell you, this guy, he, he's a real deal. He's not making some of this stuff up. He, he has been there. Uh, and he's worked with farms all over this country. And I have not had the experience that, that Ray has, but all I can tell you is, I'm becoming a firm believer that this is not the biggest value I'm getting here. It's this one right here. <clears throat> Ray said that for a row crop operation, you want all that, all those plants out there in the winter so you're continuously feeding the biology. Does it look like that maybe by doing this, the bale grazing, we're feeding biology in the wintertime? And yeah, the biology is going to be kind of semi-dormant at that time. But can you imagine in late March and early April, the smorgasbord that that biology is going to have when they wake up to that? Another thing that you can do to increase um, or to, to eliminate fertilizer use is right here, uh, clipping pastures. So let me read this. Uh, this is by Sir Albert Howard in the 1940s. Uh, the destruction of a pest is the evasion of rather than the solution of all agricultural problems. Now, I think he may be a little bit strong saying all, but I might say most agricultural problems. What is Sir Albert Howard saying here? And I'll paraphrase, but what he's saying is if you shoot the messenger without receiving the message, you will never correct your underlying problem. And weeds are telling us a story. We're not good at extension of ever talking about that and, and knowing what different weeds are telling us, but just about every weed, just as, as Ray said, has a purpose, right? And our job is when we see, in this case, ragweed, the, the problem here is this is the best soil on, on both farms I have, Murray Silt, six acres of pure Murray Silt soil, but it's probably been tilled, Keenan, for 150 years plus. Highly compacted. Ragweed does very well on that, especially when we had a mild drought, no, no rain in June, ragweed takes over in that situation. So learn what the weeds are telling you. And as Jeff Lemkuller would say, learn to make lemonade out of lemons. In the short run, long run, once you correct that problem, you will correct the weeds. Um, by the way, there's two things you're gaining by doing that at the right time. You don't want to wait until it's all carbon, clip them when they're still vegetative. But you will get conversion of raw N, P, and K in that process. You also, as what would be most important to Ray, is you will feed the biology of that soil. Again, I'm giving a, a very quick presentation, to a, a long presentation. If you are interested in learning more on how to use weeds, go to this book right here, Newman Turner, Pasture Fertility. All right, I'm going to show a, very, a few pictures of a transformation of, of the second farm in, in Woodford County. Ray? It's, by the way, all these slides are in your, are in your hand in your book. So that, that book is in your slides. All right. so. Quick history here, uh, I just took over this farm about three years ago. I put cattle on in late fall, so fall of, of 2019, but I was slowly bale grazing over the farm here. So this, the, this had been hay, the last anything had been done to that was in late June 
of 2019, this is accumulated. Again, look at the two pictures on the end. You'll, you can see it a little better. That's accumulation of growth from late June in, through the end of the growing season. Does it look like a worn down farm to you all? It was completely worn out. If this, farm, if this soil did not get its, its regular doses of urea, it did not know how to grow. And I can say, can say 100%, and, and I agree with Ray on this, that soil was addicted to urea. There's no other way of saying it. Did not how to, know how to grow anything without it. All right, so this is May 3rd, 2020. The, this is the grazing stick. There's four inches. That pasture had not been grazed yet. On my, and Keenan is eyes are getting like this. On my other farm, if now I'd gone over the entire other farm, but if I had, if I had missed a pasture on the other farm, you would not be able to see that on the grazing stick. Does that look like about as poor production as you could ever have on a, on a cattle farm? So in other words, the soil did not know how to grow without what? It's, it's regular dose of urea. Here's May 6th. That's the last, I was still feeding hay that first spring. I was still feeding hay. That was the last bale, so it probably ran out, ran out about May 9th. Um, and I'm going to show you a quick series of pictures. So in early June, um, every picture you see are when the cattle went into a pasture, not when they're about ready to be taken off. A lot of weeds is what you'll see. Here's July. But one thing I was diligent about, as soon as the cattle came off the section, I was mowing it. So I was feeding the biology. The only thing that grew well in here was annual lesbides that first year. Only thing that grew well. Here's a second winter. So I fed one more winter, about the same number of bales. Um, and so, again, this is the previous year, what, what it looked like in early May. Very quickly, so Jeff Lemcooler was on this farm that second year. So not this, this May, the following April. It was right before turkey season, so maybe around April 10th. So at that time, Jeff, did that farm look better one month prior to what we're looking at here? Or at least as good? Okay, it's... But a month earlier, right? A month earlier. Okay, so now what I'm going to show you is, is one year later, so not the exact date, not the 6th, but the 9th, and I'll let you all uh, ponder wh whether or not the fertility increased on this farm. Without one pound of commercial fertilizer. The only thing I can explain this was the soil biology. Because I put the same amount of NP and K in terms of those, the bales that were out both winters, but the second spring, it's like a, a switch went off or went on. And the only thing I don't know for sure, and we can have Ray maybe talk about it, I think it was a soil bile. It took two years, but after that second year, the soil biology changed, and it was like a light switch went on. Uh, here's, here's July of that year, high summer. Here's fall of that summer. Again, there's, there's May to begin with. So I'm not saying this will work on every farm, but at least in my experience on that one farm, just basic rotational grazing. You all know I'm not a mob grazer, and I'm not moving even every day, every day. Occasionally I will, but probably on average every two or three days. With me, the only legume that I could get in consistently was the annual lesbides the first two years. I've got some clover now. Bale grazing certainly helped. I, can't, I don't know if this was 30%, 50 whatever, but bale grazing certainly was a big part of that transformation. And then, I, again, I would argue kind of strategic clipping of those pastures. And this is what this is where it kind of fits into Ray's talk. Somehow, and again, I don't know what percent in each of these, but it, somehow those combine pr what I would call prime the pump for that biological cycling of fertility. Once you get that biology cycling, as Ray pointed out, wonderful things can happen. And to me, the, 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 if there's many things that, that do positive things that occur, but to me, I can sum it up into one, one simple thing, and that's you start building organic matter at a very quick um, rate, much quicker than soil scientists would have ever guessed even five years ago. Is that correct, Ray? Once you build up that organic matter, you're, you're like coasting. You have to really screw things up to, to really hurt the fertility of that farm. Uh, this is late, Jan so this is the farm I've had about 15 years. I've bale grazed for about 12 years on it. That's mid-January, that picture, and that's what roughly half the farm in mid-January will look at, look like on a typical year without one pound of commercial fertilizer ever being put down on that farm. Can we have a cattle farm without relying on commercial fertilizer? All right, 